like me, but it's hard to believe that this year is coming to a close. Doesn't it seem like this year just started? Um, it does. I know I wrote in the bulletin article that, you know, my mom and dad used to say that the years just fly by. And when you're, when you're a kid, it's like the years drag by. But the older I get, it seems like the years go by faster and faster. And I know when I say that, I'm sounding more and more like my parents. And I don't know whether that's a good thing or not, but, but it seems like time is flying by very quickly in just a few short days. The year 2013 will be history, and the year 2014 will be a reality. To me, it's just amazing, 2014. Um, it, it's hard to believe that that's going to be upon us in just a few days. But once again, in the next few days, you and I will be given a tremendous opportunity to learn from the past not only to learn from the past, but also to prepare for the future. Each, each new year is kind of like a, a new birth. It's kind of like a new beginning. It's a new chance. It's a new opportunity. And I, I'm not talking about today, you know, a resolution to lose weight. All of us need to do that. And Vicki and I were talking about that this morning. I need to begin to do that in just a couple of days. And I'm, I, I, I'm not talking about those things, but I'm talking more in spiritual terms. What, what a great opportunity for us to sit back and say, okay, this year, this next year, 2014, I want my life to be different. As I sat and thought this week and just kind of prayed through some things, I, I wrote down just a couple of introductory thoughts about a new year and the opportunity that it presents for me and the opportunity that it presents for you. And I wrote down, this is in your notes, the first thing I wrote down is this, that a new year is an opportunity for reflection. And it is. What were, what were some of the positive changes that you made in your life this last year? Maybe, maybe a year ago, you sat back and said, boy, you know, there's some things that I need to change in my life, and you, you made those changes, and, and you've reaped the results. Now's the time to reflect on that. What were some of your mistakes this last year? All of us made some. What, what were some of your mistakes? What were some of your failures? Yeah, what were some of your sins this, this past year? Now is a great time to reflect and do a personal examination. The Bible talks about that. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, examine yourself to see whether your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. This is a great time to do that. But a new year is not only a great time uh, to reflect, but it's also a time or an opportunity for correction, uh, my son Justin that's in Guatemala has a way of saying things clearly and succinctly. And the other day, if you follow him on Twitter or on Facebook, this was his tweet. This was his New Year's resolution. I think we'll put it up on the screen. He said this, everything beneficial that I did, do it a little bit more. Everything destructive that I did, do it a little bit less. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty succinct. I actually want to correct that and say, Justin, everything beneficial you did, do it a lot more. Everything destructive you did, do it, don't do it at all, not just a little bit less. But this year is an opportunity for us to allow the Word of God to change us. As your pastor, I would encourage you this year to allow the Holy Spirit of God to take the Word of God and to mold you and to change you into who God wants you to be. A new year is not only a great time of reflection and correction, but it's also a tremendous opportunity for consecration. By that I mean that this is a tremendous time to renew your commitment to the Lord. Anybody go to youth camp when you were a kid? Anybody go to youth camp? I remember on youth camp, uh, we always, on Friday night, they had the consecration service. If you went to youth camp, you're familiar with what I'm talking about. And they would have this great big bonfire, and everybody would be given just a little stick. You were given just a little twig. And the idea was at some point, do you remember that? Anybody else do that? At some point during that service outside, you were encouraged to take your little stick and to throw it into the fire. 
Now, if you didn't do that, you said, Brian, okay, Brian, I don't get it. What's the symbolism of that? Well, the symbolism was this, that you were kind of surrendering your life. You were giving up your stick. You were giving up your will, and you were surrendering to the Lord. Well, we're not going to have a bonfire down front today. Mark, our facilities guy, wouldn't be too keen on that. But, but uh, today, I'd like to have you pretend like you have that proverbial stick in your hand. And realize that as this year ends, and as a new year begins, this is a great time to commit yourself to God afresh and anew. What is it that God wants you to do in the year 2014? Well, today's passage, and I haven't forgot about our passage. In today's passage, we see a transition. A transition from the old to the new. Now, I realize that Luke chapter 2 is not talking about a new year. But with the birth of Jesus Christ, there were many transitions that were taking place. There were many changes that were taking place, both nationally in the nation of Israel and even individually in the lives of people. Israel was in a state of transition. Israel needed to learn some very important lessons. And quite frankly, the lessons that Israel needed to learn are the lessons that you and I need to learn as well. And so grab your Bibles with me today. We're going to look at a long passage of Scripture. not going to read it all right now. But Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, we just went through on Tuesday night and we saw the birth of Jesus and, uh, and the shepherds coming and worshiping Jesus and all of the events surrounding the Lord's birth. Verse 21. Eight days later, eight days after the birth of Jesus, when the baby, when Jesus was circumcised, he was named Jesus. By the way, we'll talk about that circumcision ceremony in just a moment, but, but that was the time when the baby was officially, officially named. And here it's interesting that, that Luke goes, goes through in details that, that the name that was chosen was not the name that, Je, that, that Joseph and Mary necessarily selected. But notice it says the name given to him by the angel before he was even conceived. We talked about that, verse 22. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents, Joseph and Mary, took him, took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord said if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and he had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord, as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child, he took baby Jesus in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, the baby's mother, this child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall. But he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. Would you pray with me today? Lord, as we look at your word, I pray that you would reveal your word to us. Father, we come before you today recognizing that we are a needy people. We we need you. 
And so, God, I pray that you would take this passage of Scripture that maybe is well known to some of us, to others of it, of us. Maybe it's the first time we're reading it. But, God, I pray that you would help us to take this passage of Scripture and understand it, understand how it applied to the people in Jesus' day. But just as important, help us to understand how it applies to us as we're concluding this year of 2013. And I pray that this year, this new year, you would produce a new us, Lord, that you would change us and mold us and shape us into who you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, this morning we face the daunting task of an extremely long passage. Today we're going to look at the rest of chapter 2, not only what I read, but actually through the rest of of the chapter. I know that's unusual for us. We, we normally don't take that long or that large of a passage, and today we're going to do a flyby over these verses. You know what a flyby is, where you kind of run through these verses quickly, but please do not misinterpret a flyby, an overview, as an indication that these verses are not important. Uh, these verses are extremely important. Jose and I, we were, we're talking about it this morning. He's preaching over in the Spanish service, and we literally said, why, we could have taken four or five weeks and preached through the passage that we're looking at today. So there is a, a bunch, there is a glob, I'm not sure whether that's a great word, but there is a glob of material in this passage and I would encourage you at some point during the week to go home and read through this passage. But, but there's numerous truths that we can apply to our lives. I kind of summarized it in two simple points that we'll kind of uh, uh, filter through and uh, put some flesh on today. But the first thing I wrote down is this. Life is filled with important events. The other day, Vicki was... Uh, was going through a 2014 calendar. Now, we have, we have a really fancy calendar system in our house. You might be the exact same way. You say, Brian, what is your calendar system? This is our calendar system right here, okay? This is the Burkholder calendar. This is pretty much, you see how fancy that is? You say, Brian, where do you buy something like this? This is really expensive. Actually, we get this in the mail every single year, and so this is our calendar. And so she was going through transposing, the, you know, the main events, birthdays and anniversaries from 2013 into 2014, and we were just kind of reading through all the things that took place in the Burkholder household in the year 2013. And, and I don't want to bore you with it. If you're interested, you can come and look at our calendar at the conclusion of the service. But there's, there's doctor's appointments and birthdays and no school days and all of that. But, but as we went through the calendar, Vicki made this comment. She said, man, we were blessed this year, Brian. And we were, as a family, we were blessed in a variety of reasons. God, God protected us this last year as I had a heart attack and kind of bounced back from that. And then, and then we went through, many of you are familiar, we went through some of the struggles with Will, who was in our house, who was a, who was a foster son in our house. And then the biggest struggle is Mark moved back home, and we're still adjusting to all of that. And then, and then Justin and Jenny went to the mission field. But, but, but as we went through this, we saw, man, our life, 2013, was filled with all kinds of events and and now we're planning 2014 and and there's even more exciting events in in 2014 well just as our life and your life is filled with with wonderful events the life of Jesus was no different and here in Luke chapter 2 we find at least four significant events that took place in Jesus's Life. And I kind of want to see them quickly, and we'll kind of give an overview over them. Then we'll go back and, and, and draw four applications at the conclusion of the service. And I kind of listed them in, in, in an alliteration way so we can understand it. The first is this. The first bullet point that I wrote that's in your notes is, the, notes is this. Joseph and Mary faithfully obeyed. Joseph and Mary faithfully obeyed. Now, these verses, and I'm looking specifically at verses 21 through 24, in, in, in those verses we see some significant and important things that are taking place. And by the way, those are very important verses. 
And they're important for a variety of reasons. First of all, they demonstrate the fact that Jesus was connected to the Old Testament. And I wish I had time. We could do a whole study. Actually, we could do a lot of studies of Jesus' connection with the Old Testament. And sometimes we feel like, okay, there was a break. All right, there's a distinction between Malachi, where the Old Testament ends, and Matthew, where the New Testament begins. There was that 400 years of silence. And so we kind of disconnect Jesus from the Old Testament but here we find a unique connection between Jesus and those Old Testament laws and Jesus and those Old Testament ceremonies although Jesus came to bring the new covenant and bring the new covenant he did Jesus completely fulfilled the demands of the Old Covenant. Notice several things quickly. Notice that Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. Verse 21, eight days later, the baby was circumcised. Now to us in this day and age, circumcision is simply a medical event. But in the life of a Jewish family, in the life of a Jewish boy, this was a very significant event. Because it was circumcision that connected him to the Jewish religion. You see, being born into a Jewish family was not enough. Each boy needed to be circumcised. Here's a verse, you can just write it down in your notes. Genesis 17, 9 says this, This is the covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Each male among you must be circumcised. And so on the eighth day, as prescribed by the Old Testament law, here are Joseph and Mary bringing Jesus to be circumcised. And so in response to God's command, Joseph and Mary obeyed the Old Testament law. There's a second thing that takes place in verse 22. We see that Mary was purified. She was actually purified on the 40th day. Notice verse 22. Then it was time for their purification offering. You say, man, Brian, things are transpiring fast. We jump from the eighth day to the 40th day in just a matter of a few words. Well, well, here's what's taking place. Once again, in observance to the Old Testament law, uh, Mary comes and, and Mary brings a purification offering. You might sit back and say, Brian, okay, I don't get that. What in the world was that all about? Well, ceremonially, religiously a lady was considered impure she was considered ceremonially unclean until 40 days had passed after the birth of that baby and after 40 days had passed she would come to the temple and she would bring a purification offering and she would sacrifice a purification offering and from that point forward she was once again ceremonially pure and once again she could enter into the temple so here we find Joseph and Mary Not only circumcising Jesus on the eighth day as the Old Testament law prescribed, but we find Mary and Joseph coming to the temple, fulfilling the Old Testament law. You say, Brian, that interests me. Well, you can read more about it in Leviticus chapter 12, and I would encourage you to do so. The third thing that takes place is this, was Jesus was dedicated in the temple. Notice verse 23 says this, the law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. In order to understand that, we've got to go back to the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 13 and verse 12 says this, you must present all firstborn sons and firstborn male animals to the Lord, for they belong to him. Here's what was taking place in the synopsis. God literally told the children of Israel this, every firstborn male is mine. He's mine. Whether it's an animal or whether it's a a human, every firstborn male is mine. And God says this, instead of actually sacrificing or giving your child to me, your son to me, you can offer an offering. And that offering went not only to take care of the priests, but it was offering an offering that demonstrated the fact that they were willing to sacrifice for the Lord. Now, if you go through and read in the Old Testament, the offering that was demanded was a lamb. You say, well, Brian, here in the passage, Mary and Joseph don't give a lamb. They give two turtle doves or two pigeons. 
The reason for that is the requirement was a lamb, but if a family was not wealthy enough to afford a lamb, they could give two turtle doves or two pigeons. And so the passage not only demonstrates that Mary and Joseph fulfilled the Old Testament law, but it also demonstrates for us what was their economic condition. They could not afford a lamb. And so as the Old Testament law demanded, here they come with two turtle doves or two pigeons, sacrificing them. That's really significant. We'll get back to that in just a second. There's a second story in Luke chapter 2 that I want you to see. The second story involves a man named Simeon. You'll see him just in verse 25. It says this, And at that time there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. You might sit back and say, Okay, Brian, who in the world is Simeon? We see that Simeon here hopefully prophesied. I use the term hopefully not insinuating any doubt, but rather as an indication of the tremendous hope or confidence that he had in God and God's word. Notice the text says several things about him. Verse 25 tells us this, he was a godly man that eagerly awaited the arrival of the Messiah. Verse 25, he was righteous, he was devout, and he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come. As a matter of fact, Simeon had received a message from the Lord that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. I read that, and that was kind of cool. Guys, how would you like to receive a, uh, a message like that? This guy was invincible. What do you want me to do? You want me to climb the ladder? No problem. I'm not going to fall. I'm not dying until the Messiah comes. All right, you need me to do something dangerous? I'm there. I'm not dying until the Messiah comes. He had received a message from the Lord that he would not be called home until Jesus came and until he saw the Messiah. And so there he was, eagerly awaiting the promise of the Messiah's coming. There's the second thing we see about him, though. He was a submissive man that faithfully obeyed the Holy Spirit's prompting. Notice verse 27. That day the Spirit led him to the temple. Of all days, it was on this day. After being led by the Holy Spirit, he went to the temple. And whether he went to the temple realizing that he was going to meet the Messiah on that day, we're really not sure. But as he arrives at the temple, being led by the Holy Spirit, there are none other than Joseph and Mary and the Messiah. It's really interesting because there would have been hundreds of people around the courtyard that day. And Joseph and Mary would not have come into the courtyard with a sign on them saying, we are the parents of the Messiah. And Jesus wouldn't have had a crown on his head indicating that he was the Messiah. But somehow, through the direction of the Holy Spirit, Simeon recognized and knew who they were in the midst of the hustle and the bustle of the temple. Simeon recognizes them. He was led by the Holy Spirit, and he recognizes the Messiah. The third thing that I wrote about him was this. He was a discerning man that foretold about the life and ministry of Jesus. In verses 29 through 32, actually through uh, verse 35, he gives this prophecy of Jesus. And it's a telling prophecy. He says just a couple of things, and I didn't put this in your notes. Let me mention them to you just in passing. First of all, he said that Jesus would be a light to the Gentiles. In verse 32, he says this, he is a light to reveal God to the nations. Now, you and I ought to read that, and it ought to resonate with our heart and mind, and we ought to yell out a hearty amen. Why? Because we're Gentiles. The majority of us are. And from the very inception, from the very beginning of his life, Simeon says why? He's not only the Messiah of the Jews, but he will bring light to the Gentiles as well. He makes a second statement. He is the glory of Israel. Man, what a phrase. We could could park there and talk about that phrase for a long time. He is the glory of Israel. He mentions a third thing. He says that his ministry will be divisive. Notice what he says in in verse 34. He goes through and says, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. What a prophetical statement. 
Is there anything more divisive in our country today than Jesus? Man, he's the dividing line. Man, you're either on his side or you're not on his side. Simeon prophesied that. Why, he's going to make many people fall, but others are going to rejoice and are going to be joyous in his return. Jesus was divisive, is divisive. And he makes a statement about Mary as well. He said that Jesus' death would cause Mary much sorrow. And a sword will pierce your very soul. Mary, sometimes I think we view her, okay, she was, uh, she was the mother of Jesus, she understood all of that, so she knew what was coming. Can you imagine the heartbreak and the sorrow, even though Mary probably realized that the death of Jesus was necessary as she saw her son go through all of that suffering. Simeon says, man, Mary, a sword will pierce your very soul. We see Simeon hopefully prophesied. There's a third story. We didn't read it in our introduction. The third story is this, that Anna devotedly worshipped. All this is taking place there in the temple. Remember, Mary and Joseph had brought Jesus to be dedicated, and as they're dedicating Jesus, Simeon shows up, and Simeon grabs the child and begins to prophesy concerning the child. And as Simeon is prophesying, another lady shows up there at the temple. In verse 36, Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phanuel from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. Her husband died when she had been married only seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but stayed there day and night, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. She came along just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she began praising God. She talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Here was this lady who had been a widow for decades and she dedicated her life the text says that she did what she stayed there at the temple day and night fasting and praying and waiting for the messiah to come let me just interject something right here because i think it's really important we find this older godly lady who realized what her ministry was and what her mission was and she spent time Fasting, praying, and praising. What a great senior adults in our congregation. I would encourage you. You have a ministry. All right? You might not be able to do the parking lot ministry. You might not be able to do something else. But you have a ministry of praying and supporting and worshiping the Lord. Take advantage of that ministry. That's what Anna did here in the passage. She spent her time worshiping the Lord. Let me ask you, you know, does your knowledge of Jesus lead you to worship? As, Mary, as, as Anna sees the Messiah, her response is worship. Does your knowledge of Jesus lead you to worship? Here's another great question that I wrote in your notes. Does your knowledge of Jesus lead you to witness? Because the text says this, that not only did she praise the Lord, but she went everywhere telling everyone about him. Her response was, you know what? I can't keep this in. I have to tell others. And tell others she did. She dedicated her life to praising and praying and to preaching. The last story in the passage, and I told you we were going to race through them quickly. The last story in the passage begins in verse 41 and goes through verse 52. And in this last story, we see Jesus confidently beginning his ministry. Man, if you think the time flew by earlier when you jumped from eight days to 40 days, all of a sudden we come to verse 41 and Jesus is 12 years old. You might sit back and say, hold on, Brian. What happened between one year and 12 years? Well, the Bible doesn't give us any pertinent, any specific information. We'll see at the end of this chapter what was taking place in Jesus' life. But we find Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, Jesus making their yearly pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. 
Now, the Passover was an eight-day celebration, and every Jewish family was required to come to Jerusalem during that time, and so the city of Jerusalem swelled during that period, and so here we find Joseph, Mary, and Jesus traveling to Jerusalem. At the end of the eight days, they left with their caravan. It was time to pack up. Passover was over. You know what it's like. Vacation's done. It's time to go home. You know, you, you know you're not excited about that. They're heading home with a caravan of people that were heading back to where they lived, and all of a sudden they got a day's journey in and Joseph looks at Mary and says where's Jesus and Mary's like what are you talking about I thought you had him and Joseph's like no I don't have him don't you have him no I don't have him and they realized that Jesus was not with them now if you're like me I've read that that passage and I think oh my word what irresponsible parents would do that you read that and think the same thing have you ever left your kids anywhere We've left our kids somewhere. I think it was at, was it Justin? We were, we were in a Bible study in, in Mexico City one time, and there were a whole bunch of people there, and we were taking a whole bunch of people home, and everybody loaded in our car, and we got halfway home, and we had the same conversation. Okay, Vicki, you have Justin? No, I don't have Justin. Do you have Justin? No, I don't have Justin. And we frantically drove back, and here's Justin sound asleep over in the corner over there. All right? Joseph and Mary were not irresponsible parents. These, uh, these families traveled together in caravans. And, and many times the children were together and they would play together along the way and they would spend the day together and it wasn't until nighttime that the families would come together and as they journeyed that first day and it was time for the families to come together when Joseph and Mary huddled together and looked for Jesus, Jesus wasn't there. So Joseph and Mary frantically make their way back to Jerusalem. It says three days. The idea is this, a day's journey away, a day's journey back and a day searching the city of Jerusalem for Jesus. And where do they find him? They find Jesus in the temple. And he's sitting there at the temple with with the Bible teachers all around him, and he's he's listening to them teach, and he's asking them questions. And the text is really interesting because not only does Jesus demonstrate a desire to learn as if he needed to learn, but Jesus knew the answers. And the text says that the religious leaders were astonished at what Jesus knew. So all of a sudden, Mary and Joseph run into the temple, and you can imagine any frantic parent. And and Mary's like, Jesus, what have you done? Why have you treated us this way? And Jesus' response is classic. In verse 49, Jesus says this, But mom, why did you need the search? He asked, Didn't you know that I must be in my father's house? If you have an older translation, it says this, Didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? And there the There are some tremendous theological truths here. Let me just mention them to you, and then we'll draw some applications today. The first theological truth is this, that Jesus had a thorough understanding of the Scriptures. Jesus had a thorough understanding of the Scriptures. Verse 47, we already alluded to that. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. But here's the second thing, and I wish we had time to talk about this this morning. We don't. Jesus had a thorough understanding of his identity. He said this, hey, mom, I need to be about my father's business. He wasn't talking about being a carpenter. They didn't find him over at the wood shop making something. They found him in the temple. And they found him discussing Old Testament, Old Testament law and how it applied to him and the people of his day. And Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. What does it demonstrate? Jesus knew who he was. You say, Brian, how old was he? He was 12 years old. And as a 12-year-old boy, he had a divine consciousness. He had a divine, he had a God consciousness. He knew who he was. And he knew what his mission was. So many people today that deny the deity and and deny the 
the miraculous events of the New Testament want to want to argue for us that Jesus didn't have a God consciousness, that Jesus was simply an ordinary man that was elevated to prophet status, and as he was elevated to prophet status, that he took upon that position himself. We see early in his life, Jesus knew exactly who he was. And Jesus knew that he wasn't just the son of Joseph and Mary, that he was the very son of God. The third thing that I wrote in my notes is this. Jesus had a normal childhood and adolescence. Jump down to the the last verse of the chapter. In verse 52, it says this. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God in all the people. I love verse 51. If you go back to verse 51, it says this. Then he returned to Nazareth with them, with Joseph and Mary, and he was obedient to them and his mother stored all these things in her heart you see and and by the way the next time we see Jesus next week we're going to be in in Luke chapter 4 the next time we see Jesus he's some 30 years old he's a grown man he's about to begin his ministry but we see that even though Jesus realized that he was the son of God he made himself submissive to his mom and dad he was obedient unto them and Jesus had a normal childhood you say Brian is that important that's extremely important why is that because Jesus was not only God Jesus was man and when the Bible says that he understands what you and I go through on a regular basis we can take that to the bank because Jesus knows what you and I go through on a regular basis all right do me a favor take a deep breath we've raced through four stories quickly Those are tremendous stories, and I'd encourage you to spend some additional time this week reading them. I guarantee you there's valuable truths that we haven't even begun to mine from them. But the second point that I put in my notes that I kind of want to draw the net on today is this. Life is filled with important lessons. You see, as we look at each of these stories, Joseph and Mary taking Jesus to the temple, circumcising him, dedicating him, Simeon's prophecy, Anna's praising, Jesus confidently beginning his ministry, why, there's lessons that we can learn. They're they're not just wonderful stories that are interesting for us to dive in and to understand, but there's actual spiritual truths there for us that you and I can apply to our lives and as we end one year and begin a new year I wanted to give you four words that we can pull from these stories four words that will help you become a new you in the year 2014 four words that will help me become a new me here's the first word that I wrote down it's this faithfulness faithfulness what a great word Joseph and Mary were faithful. Joseph and Mary were were diligent in obeying the Old Testament law. That's significant to me because if anybody could have blown it off, Joseph and Mary could have said, well, you know what? That's just for other people. We're the parents of the Messiah. We don't have to do that. We don't have to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. We don't have to go through all of that. Why, we have God living with us. We don't have to be that faithful. What do we find? We find Joseph and Mary being extremely faithful. They were were obeying the Old Testament law to the letter. Man, let me challenge you with that today. And obviously you and I are not under the Old Testament law, and I'm certainly not saying today that we got to follow the Old Testament law to the letter. But you and I must be faithful to the commands of Scripture obedience does not save us we are saved by grace and by grace alone but obedience is vital for God's blessing and God's usefulness in our lives Uh, I'm amazed at how many believers I talk to even in this day and age that that know that they are violating scripture and they're comfortable with that. They know they're doing something that God either prohibits or they're not doing something that God commands, and they're okay with that, as if if God was going to grade on a curve. Say we got eight out of ten. That's pretty good. Listen, 
Here's the truth that I want us to understand this morning. Obedience is extremely vital. Do not underestimate the importance of obedience. I read one verse yesterday that I added to my notes that was just so poignant. Luke 6.46, Jesus says this, Why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? Wow. Let that sink into your mind and heart. Why do you call me Lord, and you don't do what I say? Church, let me, let me encourage you this year. Let's be faithful. Let's, let's do what God has called us to do. You say, Brian, man, 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 I could begin to list a whole list of commands that are given in God's word. You get in God's word. You find them, and you obey them. Faithfulness. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, obey my commands. The first word, if you want God to develop a new you this year, determine to be faithful. Here's the second word that I pulled, and I pulled it from Simeon's story. The second word is this. It's the word hope. You see, if you know Simeon's story, Simeon was a man that had hope. It was hope that drove him to, uh, to, to have faith. It was hope that drove him to continue in the midst of a culture that was experiencing despair, anguish, and even hopelessness. We didn't have time to talk about the culture that was taking place in Jesus' day, but the Jewish people were extremely hopeless 400 years of silence, Roman imposition. They thought that God had forgotten about them. And in the midst of a hopeless, despairing culture, here was a man that stood up and believed God. Here was a man that stood up and had hope. Let me ask you this morning, what is it that you are hoping in? If you're hoping in our government today, you're in trouble that's not a political statement. Doesn't matter who's in office. If you're hoping in our government, you're in trouble today. If you're hoping that our economy is going to turn around, you're in trouble today. If you're hoping in your expertise to get you out of situations in the future, you are in trouble. The only hope that we have that's solid, that's secure, is Jesus Christ. It is hope in Jesus that eliminates despair. You see, it doesn't matter what's going on in our country. We have hope. It doesn't matter whether we have a job or don't have a job. We have hope. It doesn't matter if the doctor comes and says, sit down, I have bad news for you. We have hope. We have hope beyond this life. Our hope is in Jesus. And if you want to be successful... If you want God to do a work in your life in 2014, put your hope in God. Let me give you a third word. The third word is the word devotion. Devotion. So I studied the life of Simeon and studied the life of Anna. I was amazed at their devotion. Why, why did God reveal himself to Simeon in such a special way? And if you read that story three times in the story of Simeon, it said that he was led by the Holy Spirit. One verse even says, and the Holy Spirit was on him. I like that phrase. It's like the Holy Spirit was just all over him. He was on him. He was guided by the Spirit. Why was it that Anna, of all the people in the temple, recognized who that Messiah was after having waited for decades? Why was it that those two were in the right place at the right time? Were they just lucky? Were they just fortunate? No. They were spending time with God in personal study, in prayer, and in praise. And God blessed that. I wrote down in your notes, God reveals his power and his purposes to those who live in his presence. Catch that. If you catch anything I say today, catch that. God reveals his power and his purposes to those who live in his presence presence.
you want a new you in 2014? The things that you've struggled with in 2013, you want them to be in the past? Live in the presence of God. Know what it's like to have an intimate, personal relationship with God. Be devoted. In your bulletins today, we've given you a, 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 a Bible reading plan. Now, you got to do a little work. you got to get online and sign up for it. There's a Bible reading plan, and you'll get an email every Saturday that's going to give you the verses to read. You're going to get devotions every single day. Make a determination this year. I am going to be devoted. Here's the last word, and I'm done. The last word is the word priorities. This is, this is the verse, even, even late last night, this verse just resonated in my heart. And Jesus, his mom and dad come, and Jesus looks in verse 49 and says this, I must be about my father's business. And when, we could talk about that forever. There was an urgency on Jesus' part. He said, you know what, no, the most important thing to me is what is important to my father. And I want to make sure my priorities are right. Let me ask you, this year, can you say with Jesus that you are about your father's business? Too often, God's business is low on our list of priorities. What would happen this year? What would happen this next year? If every member of Hollywood Community Church decided that God would be first. God would be first. In the decisions we make, God's first. In the way we spend our money, God is first. In the way we use our time, God is first. In the way we manage our lives, God is first. And as we take a year from now, We take that 2014 calendar and we can look back over all the events of our calendar. We can say, wow, God was first in my life during 2014. We must be about our Father's business. So in just a couple days, 2013 ends, 2014 begins. God's not finished with you yet. You say, Brian, how do you know that? Because he's not finished with me. God's still working on me. And God's still working on you. And God wants to create a new and better Brian. Philippians 1, 6. He who began a good work in you will fulfill it. He will finish it. God's begun a work in your life. Would you partner with him this year? Would you say to God this year, I'm going to be faithful. This year, I'm going to hope in you. God, this year, I'm going to be devoted. And God, this year, my priorities are going to be right. I'm going to put you first.